Well, I hope everybody has your Bibles here. We're going to go through some scripture, but we've got a lot of, I guess what some people may say is boring, but to me it's not boring at all. Um, Because, you know, as I watch things on social media and what's going on in the world, I, and it's, I'm amazed, to tell you the truth, I'm amazed how many Christians get sucked into things um, and they don't even know any background about it, but they'll see a TikTok video and, they're, and they believe that. And I'm talking about, too, there's a lot of propaganda and a lot of lies and a lot of deception going on concerning the Bible, concerning the Word of God, and especially the King James Version. The attacks against the King James Bible are vicious, and they've been going on, what you guys don't realize is really for centuries, and they've been going on mainly all pushed by the Roman Catholic Church. Now, I want to say this as I get ready to get into this, um, that when I talk about the Roman Catholic Church, and most of you, if you listen to me at all, you know that I vehemently hate and despise the Roman Catholic Church. It is uh, of the devil, okay? <laughs> hey, you can clap, that's fine. It's never been true Christianity. It's never represented true Christianity. It has been, as uh, Leonard Ravenhill say, the great, said back in his book, Re- Why Revival Tarries, he said it's the greatest forgery Lucifer ever made. Um, and actually, it's not, it's not really even a good forgery. Um, but they have been the enemies, their leadership, not the people. Now, I don't have a problem with the people. It's been their leadership, the hierarchy, uh, the priests, the bishops, the cardinals, the popes. Um, and then the people who sold out, the Protestants, the, those of us that are on our side that sold out to the Rome, whether it be for money or for, you know, scared that they were going to be killed. Um, but this battle has never ceased. A lot of people think, oh, it, everything changed in, you know, the 20th century and the 21st century. Oh, no, it got worse. And I'm probably not going to be able to do all this in one session. So I didn't, I was going to try to do it in one, but we may have to finish tonight because I need to give you the history. You need to know where. The Bible came from. Where did the scriptures go when the apostles wrote it? Where did it go after that? And how did we end up with the Bible, especially the New Testament? We know exactly how we got the Old Testament over several thousand years with, uh, you know, different writers. And and it's all been confirmed and copied. And, of course, the Septuagint version, I'll probably show you that in a second. But... Uh, proved that the Bible was completed by 400 B.C. and the Old Testament, and then we get into the New Testament. So this is mainly the, the history of the New Testament, and let's see if we're going to, this thing's going to work for me today. Oh, I love it. It's working. <laughs> Hallelujah. This, this scripture right here, uh, 2 Peter 1, 19-21, he says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy, Whereunto you do well that you take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Now, what he's talking about in that verse is that uh, even though they were prophets, they were apostles, they operated in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He said, we have a more sure word. And what he was referring to is the Holy Scriptures. Okay. Now, of course, the apostles words, what they taught us was inspired by God and became Scripture. I love how Peter in 2 Peter 3 calls Paul's writing scripture and so forth. But he said this really strongly here. He was telling us, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, again, we contend, of course, that the Bible is the inspired, infallible inerrant word of Almighty God, that God moved upon certain men to write down what he wanted and that he promised to preserve that, okay? And here's a few more scriptures we're going to go through right here. Uh, Of course, this is how important the word of God is. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Peter that we are born again by the word of God, but it's how faith comes. 
And that we have to have faith to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have to have faith to believe anything. And that faith has to be stirred up in us because the Bible says this in Romans 12, 3, that God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. But it's stirred up and it comes to fruition when what? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Psalm 138, 2, look what the Lord says. He says, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Now, you need to stop and think about that for a minute. And I'm getting a ring up here, so you might need to turn me down a little bit or turn the monitors off. I don't need the monitor. Um, but think about God saying that he's magnified his word above his name. And he said, if you blaspheme his name, you're breaking one of the Ten Commandments. You're guilty. I mean, he doesn't take it lightly. And the Bible says the name of Jesus is the name above every name. And that the name of Jesus is how we're saved. The name of Jesus is how you get healed. The name of Jesus is how we cast out demons. The name of Jesus is everything. We have to call upon the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth to be born again, to be saved, to be forgiven of our sins, to inherit eternal life. And then the Lord says he has magnified his word above his name. Everybody get that? How important is the word of God to God? Do you think, and let's just get this down in us. Do you think for one second that God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, cannot give us a book that he wanted us to have and keep it preserved, making sure that it was the same when he gave it to the apostles as what we're reading today? You believe that? I mean, either he's able to do it or he's not. And if he's not able to do that, then what are we, what are we talking about? Why are we even here? Right? This is what should be one of the most, one of the easiest things that in the world. Right? But then he says this, he tells Timothy, of course, and that from a child that has known the Holy Scriptures. So again, Paul referring back to the written word of God. Everybody say this with me. The written word of God. It's important. Yes, I believe God still speaks to his people, but the most important thing for us as a people, as Christians, is the written word of God. That's how we grow. It's how we learn. It's how we discern and judge what's true and false and what's good and holy. And let me just say this. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 says that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is powerful. I challenged somebody the other day, just read it. Just sit down and take time to read and if because they never would read and they were having all these spiritual problems and heaviness and attacks. And I said, just sit down and start reading the Bible every day. Do that first and see what happens. And you know what? They came back and told me it was transforming their lives. I saw one lady who was one of the meanest ladies I've ever known. Cat. She knows. She was shaking her head. Yeah, I know you're going to talk about mean as a snake. She was my boss's wife, but she worked at the business, and she was mean every day. I mean, she was mad about, at the world. She was mad at me, and I didn't do anything. And, I mean, she wanted to argue with me every time I walked through the office. And her, she played the, and get this, she played the piano in the Baptist church every Sunday. But she didn't believe the Bible. She didn't believe in God. She was angry at God. I mean, she was just a mess. She was a mess. And some preacher came through and challenged her. To read the Bible, because she was always wanting to argue stuff. And the guy said, have you read the book? Have you read the whole thing from Genesis to Revelation? Have you read it? She went, mm -mm, no. Then you don't have any room to talk about anything. You don't even know what it says. So she said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to read the Bible. <laughs> By the time she got about halfway through... It was transforming her and changing her into the sweetest person that I have, that, that we know. She was born again through it. She was repented. She got deliverance. She, she, she started coming to work, wanting to hear about the word and want me to, and then asked me to start teaching a Bible study after work. And we started having, we'd work all day. And then have a Bible study, wouldn't we, Kevin? We'd have a Bible study for three or four hours from like five o'clock in the evening. We'd be there eight, nine o'clock studying the Bible with them for hours. And people got saved. 
People got saved through that at work through that Bible study. But because she read the Bible. The Bible is a wonderful thing. There's all these people, you know, you, you ever heard anybody say, oh, you're worshiping a book? Anybody here, you heard people say, especially these people in the Torah movement, oh, you're worshiping a book when you start getting strong about the scriptures. And you know where that, 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 uh, that in all my studies, that voice comes from? Who said that? The Roman Catholic Church said that. Once the Protestant Bible started coming out, there's like, y'all worshiping a book. Y'all supposed to be worshiping the Pope, not a book. He said, from a holy child, you have known the, ho the, the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture. Somebody say all. all. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That means not without sin or it means mature, that the man of God may be mature, spiritually mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So the scriptures are inspired. That word there means God breathed them upon these men and they wrote down what he wanted. Now, this should be fundamental, but it's not. I mean, we got people now, oh, you know, the Mandela effect. The, the, they figured out quantum physics and they're changing the Bible. No, no. God said his words are pure as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation. What did he say? Forever. Forever. And he has. Uh, we have... A un amazing amount of manuscript evidence. Of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls were one of them. And the Dead Sea Scrolls, why they were so important is, you know, there was a gap between, with the, with the Old Testament, there was a thousand year gap from one of the last copies that we had, right? And, we, and they were saying, well, there's this thousand year gap. And we don't know if what we're reading today is the Bible. This is what these... Uh, liberal scholars would say, you know, these liberal theologians, and a lot of pastors, y'all are going to find a lot of your pastors are Roman agents. Um, but when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, God always has a little secret. You know, he, Jesus talked about the stones crying out. He's always got a little stuff hidden in the dirt somewhere. Um, but when they were found, started being found in 1947, they, this is what they found. They found the entire Bible. They found, of course, Enoch was in there as well. We'll talk, you're gonna, we're gonna talk about Enoch today. I think Sal's gonna address that a little bit. We do believe Enoch is legit, and that's a whole other story. It's another message. But what was important about the Dead Sea Scrolls that, that showed, and when they pulled out the, the Isaiah scroll, for instance, it was a perfect, I mean, just a perfect manuscript copy going all the way back to about three, 100 BC. And when they compared the Isaiah scroll to what we have in our King James Bible, it was 99% right on the money. The only 1% was little differences in punctuation and a few little things, but minor. And that proved to the world that God had preserved his word through that whole thousand year period and that you still have it today. Now, that was the Old Testament. Oh, I got to make sure I point in the right direction. Oh, we're going backwards. All right, hold on. There we go. We're moving now. So the Bible's unique, and this is what I say here. The Bible has more manuscript evidence than any 10 pieces of ancient literature combined. There are more than 24,000 copies of portions of the New Testament in existence today, of which date back to the first century. In comparison, the Iliad by Homer only has 643. That comes in second. The Iliad. We, 643 manuscripts, and people think, whoo, we got the real Iliad from Homer. The New Testament, we have 24,000 manuscript copies dating back to the first century when they were written. That is, actually, actually to tell you that is near impossible by simple human means. That has to be supernatural. 
The discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls written in Greek, uh, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic contain all books of the Old Testament except for Esther, includes a copy of the book of Enoch. These manuscripts date back to 300 B.C., like I said, confirm that the Old Testament scriptures were translated accurately for the last 2,300 years. The Isaiah scroll was compared to the Bible we have today, and they are identical. And I talk about the King James Bible that we have today. Now, and there's, of course, the Septuagint version was done in 248 B.C., 250 to 248 B.C. And again, it just proves the, if you have a translation of the entire Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek, which is the Septuagint version, in 250 B.C., then it had to be done before that. So you have a witness from a worldly source, because that was Ptolemy, king of Egypt, had that translation done. It's just letting you know the Bible was already intact. The Old Testament was already intact. So now we know where we got the Old Testament. Are you all ready for this little journey we're about to go on? Because I'm about to show you some things that I've pieced together that it, I, all my years of walking with the Lord, I haven't heard. I didn't realize. And um, I think a lot of it has been hidden from us because Rome does a great work in hiding information that they don't like or by jumping upon it and putting their spin on it like they do in Israel. They'll, they'll have, oh, this place over here is the garden tomb. And you're like, no, it's not. You can read what the Bible says and the garden tomb is over here. So I've seen the Catholic version of things and then you can find the true version of things. But it says the entire New Testament was written through the efforts of just eight people. Six of these were selected apostles of Christ. Three were eyewitnesses of his life and ministry. That would be Matthew and uh, Peter and John. Two were brothers of Jesus, James and Jude. One, the apostle Paul, was specially called to serve uh, the Gentiles. For three years he was taught by Jesus in the deserts of Arabia. The last were Mark and Luke who were probably authored... Uh, his gospel and the book of Acts under the Apostle Paul's supervision. Maybe we don't know, but we know who these men are, right? So, there you go. And that gives you a little date right there. Um, again, some of that we know for sure. Of course, the book of Revelation we know for sure. Some of those dates may vary just a little bit, but that's about the dates and time periods they were written. But John wrote, probably he wrote, well, you know he wrote the book of Revelation about A.D. 95, but he may have written first, second, and third John much later. I think that John, John may have lived, as what I'm discovering, I think John may have lived to 120 years old. And if he did, he went further into the second century than I think a lot of the liberal scholars want to admit. That gave him time to disciple some people like Polycarp and others that got to see him. Uh, so let's, this is an important little graph here. Um, this shows you just kind of Peter and Paul and John, these apostles, the men that they discipled that kind of took over and took the gospel out. And you're going to see this. And also... There was one of these, and they call these the early church fathers just because you know, we don't really have a better name for them. You could call them the early disciples of the disciples, right? Um, but you have direct, I mean, these were people who are mentioned. Clement of Rome was mentioned in the Bible. He's mentioned in Romans. And Paul directly talks about him. And when you get into the first century, especially after the death of Paul. He comes in and takes over. And he's actually the bishop of the Church of Rome or overseer uh, before the Roman Catholic Church, before the corruption, before the falling away happens there and, the, the, and everything happens. So there was, there was this time period. You know, let, let me just go in and tell you, the Roman Catholic Church really didn't come into being until even an early date is like 313 A.D. So you've got this... 200 years, like say from John, the Apostle John, you got this 200 years. And most people don't, most Christians have no idea what happened in those 200 years. And it's, it's important. So another one that was an eyewitness uh, of Peter and a disciple of Peter was Ignatius of Antioch. Um, John's disciples, you have Polycarp, 
and then Polycarp discipled Irenaeus, and then Irenaeus discipled uh, Hippolytus. Now, Hippolytus is very important because he is the one who gave us a list of the people who were the 70. Everybody remember Luke chapter 10? Remember that Jesus sent out 70 to cast out demons and heal the sick, and they came back rejoicing, and Jesus said, you know, they, they were rejoicing that the devils are subject to us in your name, right? Did I say something funny? Okay. All right. Sometimes I, I get going and I say something, they'd look at me funny and let me know. Um, but Hippolytus is going to be important in this discussion because, again, he, he had information that came, I believe, directly from the Apostle John and from Polycarp about who the 70 were and where they went to take the gospel and become the leaders and overseers. And when you begin to see this, and then you see the translations of the Bible that appeared in those same places, you go, oh, this is cool, right? So the process of collection here, let's see. Um, of the books, the New Testament began in the first centuries of the Christian church very early on. Some of the New Testament books were being recognized. Paul considered Luke's writings to be authoritative as the Old Testament. He says that. Peter recognized Paul's writings as scripture. Some of the books of the New Testament were being circulated among the churches already. You can see that in Colossians 4.16, 1 Thessalonians 5.27. Clement of Rome mentioned at least eight New Testament books, and he talked about this in his writings. You can read Clement's writings, and he talked about this in AD 95, about the New Testament being almost put together fully. Um, you have uh, Ignatius of Antioch acknowledged seven books in AD 115, and I believe that's because John hadn't written the last of his books yet. And then uh, Polycarp, a disciple of John the Apostle, acknowledged 15. Later, Irenaeus, Irenaeus mentioned 21 books. Hippolytus recognized 22. And in three, by 397 AD, the Council of Carthage published the list of the books of the canon that we still use today. Now, the Catholic Church did not do that, y'all. These were the apostles and the disciples of the apostles, the ones saying, that's books inspired and that's not. Let me just go on ahead and dispel this idea that the Catholic Church decided this. At this point, the Catholic Church didn't even have their Bible yet. They hadn't even put one out. It wasn't until 405, you're going to see this, 405 that Jerome, the Roman Catholic, put together his Latin Vulgate Bible. So there wasn't a Catholic Bible. Somebody say, no Catholic Bible until 405. So what are all these Bibles before? Who are they done by? They're, they're the writings of the apostles, and then they are put together and they are picked as what has been inspired by the men that were the disciples of the apostles. Does everybody get that? I hope so. Some of, some of you are like, I hate history class. Well, I'm sorry. It's history today. All right. Now, this is how you think about John. This is the apostle John. This is how serious he was because he got to live longer than the other Apostles, so he began to see the false doctrines creeping into the church. He began to see the Gnostic stuff, the stuff from Simon Magus, you know, the Simon the sorcerer of Acts chapter 8, and the people who began to follow him. So the, the false teachings and the wolves in sheep's clothing, it began early, and you had the Gnostic teaching, where you had the dual, uh, the ideas that there were two gods, one God of the Old Testament, and Jesus was the God of the New Testament, and all these different ages and eons and different gods and stuff. All of that stuff started creeping in, and the Gnostic error started creeping in that, that the flesh didn't really exist or it was evil. They had different ideas about that, and you were only a spirit being, and uh, really, all the stuff the Gnostics believe, they believe in this strange predestination, kind of like Calvin does. And I mean, they, they had some stuff. So this stuff was creeping in, and they would deny that Jesus actually came in a fleshly body because they thought the flesh was evil, so that Jesus couldn't have come in the flesh. And this is why the apostles over and over say, if you do not confess that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, you are antichrist. Now think about that. 
If you just went around saying Jesus didn't come in the flesh, because why? You were blaspheming him becoming a man to be the sacrifice for our sins. He had to become a man. So you're blaspheming. So they were fighting all this false doctrine. In fact, you can see that Paul was fighting it in Colossians and Ephesians. Uh, John was fighting it. But John says this, and, he, and he's saying this as a very old man that's getting ready to go to heaven. And, you know, when you get old and you're going to get ready to go to heaven, you want to tell the truth because you're about to meet your maker, right? He says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Now, that's how serious this is. But how, do you, how are you going to know the doctrine of Christ if you don't know the Bible? Can anybody tell me that? How are you going to know what he taught? But who knows what he taught? Who spent three plus years with him every day? You know, if you spent three, three years, you know, think about this. Think being in a, in a small group of people for three years, walking everywhere that you go, spending the night together out under the sun, laying your head on a rock. They saw everything Jesus did. They heard everything he said. They saw the way he did it. They knew what he taught. And he picked them to continue sharing that to the world because he had to go back. You understand? They were picked to give us his teaching, his life, his doctrine. And that's what they did. Peter, Paul, James, John, Thomas. You're going to see. But he says, if you don't abide, if you don't live and dwell and have your being in the doctrine of Christ, you don't even have God. And that's basically God saying it's my way or the highway. Right? And you better know his way. That's why I tell people all the time, you better check me. I try to bring you the receipts, as they say, but you still better check me. You are responsible to know the word of God for yourself. The problem is most people don't take the time to find out and they just listen to somebody and then you don't, you're going to, a lot of people are going to be on, at judgment day and go, well, I listened to that guy. I listened to Kenneth Copeland. Sorry. I mean, I'll name names. I don't care. But he said, if you don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, you do not have God. And it says, he that abides, and that is a present tense Greek verb, ongoing, continuous, you know, all in the present, taking place in the present. He's saying there, if you will live, you've got to live in the word of God. You know, I can tell you this much. If any, anybody, can, they want to argue with me, but they can't argue with this. For 37 years, I have lived abiding in the word of God. And I love it. And I'm still learning and I'm still reading and I'm still studying. Because, why? Because it's alive and it's powerful and I, I know I don't know everything. And you've got to keep in it because you, that's where your life comes from. I mean, he told Timothy, he said, you better take heed to the doctrine you teach because in doing so, you will save others that hear you and you will save yourself. If I don't teach you correct doctrine, the doctrine of Christ, what's, what's sound doctrine from the Bible, I will go to hell. I could walk with Jesus for 40 years and start teaching error and go to hell. That's why Paul said, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. He said desperately one time, he said, you know what? He said, I just hope I make it. I hope I make this gospel that I preach. That I don't somehow fall away. You know, even in some of these early church fathers, I found that like, Tertullian was one of the greats of the second century. Into the third century. He was one of our greatest theologians. One of our most prolific defenders of the faith. And sound doctrine. And a false prophet came along. And he got deceived and pulled into it. It's scary out there. They are after you. And then he tells us this, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed, for he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. 
This is something, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because there can be no compromise, no blessing, no affiliation, no let's just get along with any heretical church cult or false teaching. That's why I don't understand these Christians that say, oh, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, but then they'll hook up with a Roman Catholic priest or go visit the Pope. I assure you, somebody like me is never being asked to visit the Pope. And if he did, I would send a letter calling him the biggest heretic and wolf in the world. You understand? And I will not sit with you, nor will I eat with you, nor will I bless you, nor will I be partaker in your evil deeds. Unless you repent of your idolatry and your deception and your error. I mean, this is what the Bible, you know, you think about 1 Corinthians 5, where he said, if a brother... If a brother among us, a brother or a sister, if they're a fornicator, an adulterer, an idolater, a covetous person, he says, you're not even supposed to eat with that person. They're supposed to be put out of the church if they won't repent. Not to be mean, but to get their attention so that they will see you can't live in these sins. Well, let me tell you, Roman Catholicism with the Mary worship and saint worship and prayers to Mary and the, the worship of the wafer cookie and all the stuff that goes on in that, it's all a system of idolatry. It is a system of greed. It is a system that is perverse and twisted. And it's always been, and, it's, and, it, it, and it is drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Do not even try to tell me the United States is mystery Babylon. The United States doesn't hold a candle. Even with all of our wars, we don't hold a candle to the people the Roman Catholic Church has killed. And the most people they've killed are people that just wanted to read the Bible. I'm going to show you. It may take tonight to get into the plot of the Jesuits. But let me just tell you this right now. It's, there's no doubt. They said back in those times that the, the church, the Roman Catholic Church said, if you read the Bible, if you have the Bible, if you translate the Bible, you're going to be burned at the stake. And you're going to tell me, let's, co let's just cozy up to these folks. Uh-uh. I remember one time I was open air preaching on Auburn University. This is funny. I'm open air preaching with another guy, and there's about 400 college students out there listening to us on a cold January day in a drizzling rain. It was miserable, just miserable out there. But these 400 kids are standing out in this cold rain hearing us preach the gospel. And I'm preaching away, man, and then, and then we, we take turns. So I let the other guy get up, and then when I quit, about 20 or 30 College students came around me, and, and we got into this discussion about once saved, always saved. And I'm just letting them have it. We're just going back and forth because, of course, there were some Baptist kids there from Campus Crusade. So we're going back and forth. And the next thing I, I see this, Adam, the peripheral vision, I see this guy sitting there going, yeah, oh, yeah, well, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, Finally, I stopped for a second. Look, it's a Roman Catholic, I mean, fully dressed Roman Catholic priest. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> uh, but what he was doing is trying to act like, oh, I agree with this fiery preacher here. Y'all kids, come on over here and listen to me. This is what they do all the time. They're, they're a bunch of little slippery, slimy. Uh, I, as you can tell, I don't bid them Godspeed. All right. Now, let's look. This is Polycarp. Polycarp was born in, in 69 AD. He became a disciple of John, the Apostle John. He was a close friend also of Ignatius. So Ignatius, who was a disciple of Paul, right, uh, Peter, they, all, they knew each other. I mean, these guys knew each other. He was a bishop of Smyrna until the Apostle John called him to help with the mission to Ephesus after the Apostle John's death. Now, this says about 
AD 115, but I, I'm beginning to think it was later. Polycarp took full control of the missionary outreach from the city of Ephesus and continued the work for about 40 more years. Somebody say 40 more years. At the end of his life, Polycarp was burned at the stake as a martyr in A.D. 56. But we still have his writings today. And he tells us some things. So there's the epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians. You can go find it online for free and read the whole thing. I've read the whole thing. It's interesting, one of the things he says here is, if you read the apostle, uh, this, this brother's... Uh, I say, you, if you read his writings to the Philippians, uh, you find him quoting the New Testament over and over and over. He's quoting Peter. He's quoting John. He's quoting Paul. So many. In fact, what we have discovered is from the writings of the early church fathers, you can just almost put the entire New Testament together again. Just from their quotes, from their sermons and their letters. Um, but here's some of the things that... Polycarp said, here's one from the epistle of Polycarp to the Philippians chapter 7, whosoever does not confess the testimony of the cross is of the devil, and whosoever perverts the oracles of the Lord to his own lust and says that there is neither a resurrection nor a judgment, he is the firstborn of Satan. Wherefore, forsaking the vanity of many, let us return to what? The word which has been handed down to us from the beginning. The man that took over for the Apostle John says, let us return to the word. And he sounds a lot like what I would say. They're of the devil. I love this. You can, you, you can read this stuff. I mean, this, is what, this was real preaching, real apostolic preaching does not play little mamby-pamby games. It just tells you like it is. Amen. Amen. Another one from Polycarp in chapter 2 says, For I trust that you are well versed in the sacred scriptures, that nothing is hid from you, but to me this privilege is not yet granted. It is declared then in these scriptures, Be angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down on your wrath. There he is calling, quoting Ephesians and calling it scripture. He says, happy is he who remembers this, which I believe to be the case with you. But he says it's declared in the scriptures. What is this man of God who took over for the apostle John, discipled by the apostle John? What is he pointing people to? The scriptures. Guess what that means? They had to exist. Meaning they were already written down. Let me tell you something I believe the Lord showed me. Remember how it says in, um, I think it's in Thessalonians and it's in Timothy where he talks about, let those who labor in the word and in doctrine be worthy of double honor. Yeah, that's in 1 Timothy 5. No, I, the Lord brought this to my mind the other day. It says, let those who labor in the word and in doctrine. I said, wait, 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 wait time out. What does it mean? Wait a minute. Doctrine is what you are laboring in the word. When you're laboring in doctrine, you're studying the Bible to find what it teaches about a certain topic or subject. So that's, that's laboring in the word. So what, and I really feel this, and you can disagree with me if you want, but this is what I believe now. I think the Lord just kind of dropped it in me. But when he said those who labor in the word and in doctrine, he's talking about two different things. And I think when he's talking about laboring in the word, he was talking about people who were copying the scriptures, the New Testament, in the New Testament church. Because where were these copies? Where, where were these? They get in the scriptures in Smyrna and Ephesus and where they were taking them. I can tell you right now, they had people copying Paul's letters. They had people copying John's letters. They had people copying the Gospels and Romans and Acts. And because they didn't have a printing press back then, it had to all be handwritten. And do you think that the New Testament church would trust a bunch of heathens to copy their Bible? No. They were copying the scriptures and taking them with them when they went. You're going to see this. Everybody good with this? Have you, how many people have not seen any of this before about these early church fathers? Just let me know. A lot of you, yeah. 
The Apostles' Doctrine, of course, Acts 2.42, if you want to turn there and look at it, you can say, do it yourself. But he says here is they, they continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine. Somebody say Apostles' Doctrine. That's what the church did then, and guess what? That's what we're supposed to do now. Now, how could we continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine if somehow we didn't have the Scriptures passed down to us, preserved every word passed down to us. We couldn't. We couldn't do it. It would be some perversion, kind of like another church I know in Italy. Right? And then, that's what I mentioned a minute ago, Peter calling Paul's writing scripture. He says, on account of the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved bro brother Paul, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, and also in all his epistles, speaking in them. Notice he said all his epistles. Somebody say all. So all of his epistles are called scripture by the apostle Peter. You hear that? He says also all his epistles, speaking in the, them of these things, in which some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned in an unstable rest or twist, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So he's calling Paul's letters, all of them scripture. Do you know we got Torah heads running around saying that the apostle Paul is a false apostle? I cannot, and I cannot believe how many Christians are falling for this stuff. And that's why Peter warns in the very next verse, he says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. So that's 2 Peter 3, 15 through 18. Somebody say, all Paul's epistles are scripture. Here's Ignatius. Ignatius said that he saw and witnessed the apostle John. What's that? What? I know. I'm sorry. Irenaeus. I'm in Irenaeus. Who did I say? Ignatius. Ignatius. Oh, yeah. It's Irenaeus. I'm in. <laughs> he said he got to see. And this is why I believe that John lived a lot longer. He may have. Because Irenaeus said that he heard John. But he, he definitely, we know that Polycarp trained him. And, let, and, and here's another thing. Irenaeus wrote an entire series of books called, what, guess what against? Against heresies. <laughs> I mean, these guys were always fighting false teaching in the church. He says, the doctrine of the apostles has been guarded as a very complete system of doctrine. Can, can we stop for a minute? Hold on. Do y'all see that? Do you see the time period in which he lived? So he, he had to be, and this was probably in the 170, 180, 190 AD time period. He's saying the doctrine of the apostles has been guarded as a very complete system of doctrine and has been preserved without any forging of the scriptures. Now, who are we going to believe? Irenaeus, trained by Polycarp, Polycarp who's trained by John, or some popopotamus. I mean, really, is it that hard to figure out? If the Roman Catholic Church didn't come to being, didn't even have a Bible until 405, how are they going to tell us that there wasn't a Bible before them? They try to tell us. They try to tell us that their Latin Vulgate Bible that Jerome did in 405, they try to tell us that that's even superior to the original Hebrew and Greek scriptures because it was inspired. God inspired Jerome to put together this Bible. But well, let me just go and tell you, the Latin Vulgate Bible, the Catholic Bible does not match the Bible that came from the apostles. Y'all hear me? I don't know about y'all, but I get fired up about this stuff. I like to know the truth. But let's read, let's read this again. Irenaeus, in his book Against Heresies, 4, 
33, chapter 4, verse 33 says, The doctrine of the apostles has been guarded as a very complete system of doctrine and has been preserved without any forging of the scriptures. Neither receive addition to nor suffer curtailment from its truths. Read the word of God without uh, fortification. I think that's supposed to be fornication there. Uh, that's that. I'm using that dang voice software. Lawfully and diligently explaining the Old Testament in harmony with the rest of the scriptures. Did everybody see that? So what he's saying is, it's been preserved. It was a, preserved as a system of doctrine. And he's saying this, like I said, I think he wrote this in about 190, 192 A.D. All right. Now, let's go back a little bit there. In the, a contemporary of that time period, Clement of Alexandria, he says, It is necessary to show how in the scriptures and in the ancient church there are both the most exact knowledge and the truly best set of principles, except no doctrine that is not clearly taught in the scriptures. Can we pause for a minute? Can I just tell you? What does Pastor Dean preach all the time? Except no doctrine that is not clearly taught in the scriptures. It must be proven logically and completely from the scriptures or it is just an opinion. Anyone who divides the body of Christ with opinions is sinning against the body of Christ. See, I don't get to have my opinions, and teach it as doctrine. You understand? I'll tell you when it's something, this is what I think, but you're supposed to go by what the Bible says, period. Right? So that was Clement of Alexandria. He lived, well, this, he, he wrote this in his book, uh, Stromata, chapter 7, 15, and 16. You can look it up yourself. And he wrote it in about 192 to 202 A.D., uh, here's Tertullian. Oh, what a great man he was, but got deceived by a false prophet in the la latter part of his life. But he said this, the apostles did not keep any secret doctrine, but thought every doctrine, uh, uh, thought every doctrine openly. Only heretics teach a secret gospel letter or doctrine. It will be manifest that where the true Christian faith is, there will be the true scriptures and the correct exposition thereof. Tertullian, and guess what his book was called? Prescription Against Heretics, 190 to 210 AD, before the Catholic Church, before the Catholic Bible. So how could, how could we know the Apostles' Doctrine if there was no Bible? See the, see, the Catholic Church even says that the only way we know that we have is that the tradition that that's the only way you can know the truth is tradition. No, these, what are these men saying? Tradition or the scriptures? 200 AD. So what does that mean? They had them then. Right? Here's another one from Tertullian. He says, take away from the heretics the wisdom that they share with the pagans and let them support their inquiries from scripture alone they will then be unable to hold their ground. Scripture alone. Somebody say, Scripture alone. Do you know that the, the popes, one after the other after the other, say you cannot live your life by the Scripture alone. You need us. <laughs> Clement of Rome was a convert of Barnabas. Now, we mentioned him a minute ago. Uh, on his first trip to Rome, he remained behind when Barnabas returned to Jerusalem, taking a year to sell his business. He then moved to Jerusalem. He studied mainly under Peter, and he was also an eyewitness of Paul and John. He wrote a work called First Clement to the Corinthians for the sake of correction about 95 AD. There is a work called Second Clement forged in his name, um, but then he went back to Rome later and became the Bishop of Rome. And look what he said. This is Clement of Rome, AD 95, Epistle to the Corinthians. Moreover, you were, you were all distinguished by humility and were in no respect puffed up with pride, but yielded obedience rather than exhorted it. He said, and, and were more willing to give than to receive. Of course, that's 
straight from Acts 20, 35, content with the provision which God hath made for you and carefully attending to his words, you were inwardly filled with his doctrine and his sufferings were before your eyes. Thus a profound and abundant peace was given to you all <clears throat> and you had an insatiable desire for doing good while a full outpouring of the Holy Spirit was upon you all. Look at that there. You were inwardly filled with what? <clears throat> doctrine. You know, in today's church, doctrine's a bad word. Well, you don't need that doctrine. You don't need no doctrine. Come over here and meditate with me. Let's visualize Jesus. <laughs> Let's take a little hit on the Jehovah Joanna. <laughs> Have a little drink of the Godka. You laugh, but I've heard every one of these from, I'm just going to call them Christian freaks that are out there just trying to find experiences in everything. That's why Bethel got off. You know, Bethel was a good church at one time. When, it, when they were still, he was still part of the Assemblies of God, they weren't way off like they are now. And you know why? Because seeking spiritual experiences came first instead of getting filled with the doctrine of the Word of God. Amen? I remember we had a group like that when we first moved to uh, Auburn, Opelika area there in Alabama to start Fire and Grace Church. And they were out, do I'm, I'm actually quoting them. They were connected to IHOP and they were out doing all this crazy stuff like that. And I was trying to correct them with scriptures, their leader and, and some of their young people, their college students, and they, they would not hear it. And let me tell you, when you won't hear correction and you won't put the word of God first, you're going to get weirder and weirder and weirder. You understand? You're going to get further and further and further off base. Um, this is great stuff. Now, of course, we know we're coming up. Remember, we're working our way up from the apostles through the first century, the second century. You know, a lot of stuff is still going on in Rome. And Constantine comes to power, and he establishes the city of Constantinople as a new capital of the Roman Empire. And Constantine built many new churches and a great imperial library there. And he went on uh, to serve the, the Byzantine Empire for over a thousand years. Now, just so you know, what happened, he, he was wanting to move the capital of Rome to Constantinople, and he changed the name to there. It, it was, uh, oh, what was the other name? I can't remember now. But um, that was in, became what was known, the empire split in two, and it became the Eastern Empire. And, but it was Greek-speaking. And so he founded all these libraries, a lot of Christians, when he changed. Now, a lot of people think that Constantine became a Christian. He did not. He, I think he might have, in his mind, thought, I'm becoming, I believe in the God of Christianity, so I am a Christian but he believed in every other God too. I mean, he was into all of his stuff. He did stop the persecution of Christians that he was doing for a little while, just a few years, and then he reinstituted it. Basically, if you didn't do things as a Christian the way he thought you should and be in the approved church that he had established, then you were being persecuted again. And then God finally just quickly, 337, all this happened between 331 and 337. Then God, just, I believe God just took him out. And, um, but the, the empire split apart and you had that, but I'm not going to get into those manuscripts and stuff. But those go back to the first century, all that. Well, I'm on now. And there it talks about Irenaeus. And Hipp I want to get to the Hippolytus here. Hippolytus was born in 170 A.D., was discipled by Irenaeus, and continued Irenaeus' work by creating his own set of against heresies. Here's another one of them. What are they writing about? Dealing with the false teaching of their day. This new set of, uh, contains additional information on cults and heresies that were started after Irenaeus' time. Again, he was martyred about 236 um, he, his writings, we have the refutation of all heresies, and there were various fragments of Hippolytus's work. But one of the things that we have, there we go, 
is his list. Now, this is a great book. If it, these are one of the resources you want to get, this is a good place to start. Um, but there's many books I've been going through, but this is one. But in this is Hippolytus' list of the 70. And he knew directly from Irenaeus and from Polycarp and from John who the 70 were and where they went. Everybody, everybody understand it. This is a very important point here. If, like my students, I'd say if you're taking, you know, on the test, you better know this, right? These 70, they knew where the 70 went, who they were, and where they went, all right? Now, let's look here. Notice what it says about Barnabas. Where did Barnabas go? The Bishop of Milan. Does anybody know where Milan is? Do you know where in Italy it is? Some people do. This is important here. We're going to show you something. I was going through maps and everything else. So you like my little arrow with Barnabas on it? <laughs> Barnabas goes to Milan. Now I want you to go. He, was, he probably went there in the, looks like the early second century, Right? Late first century, early second century, he goes to Milan. He becomes the overseer of the church in Milan. I want you to notice what Milan is close to. It's close to Turin, and it's close to this area of the Alps there. Everybody see that there uh, that I put in red? That's pronounced Vaudois, the Vaudois people, okay? Because what happened there is Christianity spread right here. New Testament Christianity, right here, spread all in this area, and this is important in this time period. Everybody say it's important. It spread right here in this area. Who spread it? Barnabas. What would Barnabas have with him since he was Paul's buddy? And he would have Paul's writings. Those writings would be in Greek. These people right here speak Latin. What do you think they did? They translated the Bible <laughs> into Latin. All right? And true, everybody say this with me, true New Testament, apostolic Christianity exploded there. Now, the Vaudois, as they're called, are also known as a group called, they became known as the Valais, who became known as the Waldensians. All right? These people were persecuted like no other for centuries. But let's, let's look at something else here. Everybody see that? All right. There we go. So this is called, this area here is called the Piedmont. Okay? And it basically, it just means the foot of the mountain. And, um, and actually, some of these people had run here to escape the, just how bad the Roman Empire had become, and they were just escaping to these mountains. But it says, In the Piedmont region of the valleys of the Alps at the northwest corner of Italy and East France, there was a people that God used to translate his preserved word into Latin. There were, they were called the Vaudois. And Hippolytus states that Barnabas became the bishop of Milan and established Christianity in that northwest corner of Italy called the Piedmont Valleys of the Alps. Piedmont means the foot of the mountain. And that's where Barnabas went with the word of God. So then I found some old books that talk about this. These are these were written back in the 1800s, uh, but confirms that those people said. And if you notice down here at the bottom, and I need to go back right here. If you notice down here, he says that the churches of the valleys of the Piedmont had served for a model to the Reformation or the reformers and has justified their undertaking, seeing that they have always preserved among them the sacred truths of the Christian religion committed to them as they receive them from the disciples of the apostles. Do you see that? 
See, Christians back in the 1700s and the 1800s, they knew these things. These things have been hidden from us. You know how I had to find this? I found this archive, downloaded it to my computer. You got to do some digging. Somebody say, old books. Old, old school's the best school, right? All right. And he goes on to talk about how they said that they were, they were passed, their, their truth and scriptures were passed to them directly from the apostles. And they say it here. He says, uh, we know what Protestants believe and practice is truly the apost apostolic faith, basically. This is also to be used to strengthen the faith of Protestants who will preserve from thence that God, according to his promise, never left himself without a witness, but has, having preserved in the bosom of these two churches the most illustrious, illustrious professors of the Christian religion, which they held in the same purity with their predecessors and had received the precious pledge from the band of the apostolic men who at first planted these churches among the Alps. So, you see, there's not just me making this up. So 157 A.D., the Vaudois Christians had translated the Bible into Latin. We call it the Old Latin Bible or the Itala because it came, and it came over 300 years. Somebody say 300 years. Before. <laughs> Before Jerome's created his corrupted, twisted Roman Catholic Latin Vulgate. The old Latin Bible spread so far that it made it to England by 200 A.D. Jerome finished his corrupted translation in 405, but the people did not want to give up their old Latin Bible, so the Pope became furious. Some ancient manuscripts did survive. Now, one of the reasons that we don't have as many manuscripts from these people as we should is because the popes would hunt them down and burn the, their, their Bibles in the fire, which they had to hand copy, burn them in the fire, and then kill and torture them. Or I should say torture, then kill them, right? Um, the old Latin Codex uh, Vercellus, Evangelorio, whatever, Preserved in the cathedral library is believed to be the earliest manuscript of the old Latin Gospels. This is a picture of that from back then. Um, but we do have, I mean, this, this entire Gospels, like the four Gospels. We have Paul's letters from this old Latin Bible that was done in 157 A.D. This is the Bible that the Roman Catholic Church tried for 1,000 years to destroy and replace with their own. Somebody say 1,000 years. For 1,000 years, the Roman Catholic Church hunted down, beat, tortured, killed, maimed, buried alive, burned at the stake, cut off heads, drove people through with stakes because they had this Bible. Because they read this Bible, because they preached this Bible that came from Barnabas, that came from Paul. Rome has always been at war with you, and they've always been at war with your Bible. Always. Here it is. This is in the book, The Understandable History of the Bible by Samuel Gipp. He says here, the old Latin Vulgate was used by the Christians in the churches of the Waldenses, the Gauls, the, Celt, the Celts, the Albigenses, and the other fundamental groups throughout Europe. This Latin version became so used and beloved by Orthodox Christians and was in such common use by the common people that the term, they assumed the term Vulgate as its name. Vulgate comes from the word vulgar, which means Latin for just common. It was so esteemed for its faithfulness to the deity of Christ and its accurate reproductions of the originals that these early Christians let Jerome's Roman Catholic translation sit on the shelf. <laughs> I love it. They knew the truth. Jerome's translation was not used by the true biblical Christians for almost a millennium, a thousand years after it was translated from the corrupted manuscripts by Jerome in 380. It's when he began his translation. He finished it in 405. 
Um, so for a thousand years, the popes tried to wipe out these true believers and their Bible. I, I had to even, I, I darkened some of this stuff. Even some of the depictions they drew of what the, they did to these poor people are, you, you can't even, you, you don't even need to see the drawings. Um, that gives you an idea. They'd run poles through your daughter's. Roast them alive. Burn them at the stake. This war was going on. Um, there were some other translations also at this time. The first translation into purely uh, European tongue was known as the Gothic version. When, guess when it happened? The Gothic version. 330. Guess what? About 75 years before the Roman Catholic perversion. Um, and it was done by a soul-winning missionary, uh, Ulphilus there. Once again, the strength of the version is found in its age and agreement. Notice that these Bibles agree when they compare these old, like this old Gothic Bible that was done in 330, when they compare it to the King James, to the text, the Textus Receptus, which the King James came from, the Greek text, it agrees with it. So guess what? If you have ancient Bibles before the Roman Catholic Church and your Bible agrees with that Bible and it's perfect, guess what happened? What's that mean? God preserved it, right? Um, it says the type of text represented in the Gothic Bible uh, from 330 A.D. is, for the most part, is that which is found in the majority of the Greek manuscripts. The Armenian Bible is referred to the Queen of Versions because it's, it has an unusually high number of extant copies. It's 1,244 copies. 1,244 copies of this Bible in Armenia. Uh, it was done by another soul-winning person, Mezrob, around 400 A.D. So he even got his done five years before Jerome finished the Latin Vulgate, but this was in a different part of the world. And guess what? It matches the King James. It doesn't match the Latin Vulgate. All right. Um, then you had this one. This one is very interesting. You have the Peshetta, and this is a translation into Syrian or Syriac, as it was called, and was produced early in the second century. It is possible that this translation was in the hands of St. John. Okay, do you hear that? They believe that this translation into the Syrian, the Syriac, was in the hands of the Apostle John. And I'm going to show you it was. There are 350 copies extant of this translation, and they support the traditional text or the Textus Receptus, which is the text that the King James is translated from. Again, when was this done? Early 2nd century in the region of... What, what, is, what, what would you be taking a Syrian, Syriac Bible to? Syria, right? The old Latin translation was in use when Jerome uh, prepared the Vulgate, translated much earlier than 300 A.D. because 50 copies are still extant and dated between 300 and 400 A.D. This translation is also a witness prior to the 4th century that testifies the authenticity of the traditional text. Folks, basically I'm going to tell you what it is. You have the text of the apostles, and you have the text of the Roman Catholic Church. And you have to choose. I'm going to tell you a little secret. I'm going to, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. All the Bibles translated in English that are not the King James Version come from the Roman Catholic, Alexandrian, corrupted stream, and not from this one. Not from the Syriac, the Peshetta, the Gothic. You understand? But this is what's interesting. Did a little, did a little digging. Y'all know how you're supposed to do a little digging, right? So here's the 70 apostles again. The 70, I mean, this, well, I believe they're apostles because they were sent out. But we'll just say the 70. And notice what it says right here. Oh, maybe it's, I didn't pull it up there. Well, oh yeah, that's, that's right. I didn't do it on that one. All right, so notice, what do we have here? We got the area of Syria right here, right? So down here is Israel. So there's Damascus down here. So if you keep going south, that'd be 
Jerusalem, Israel, and all that, and you have Apamia, Laodicea. There's two Laodiceas. One's over here. This is Laodicea of Syria. Antioch, uh, which was where the famous church was, where Christians were called, were first called Christians in Antioch. Edessa, we'll get to that at some point. Tarsus, remember, uh, that's where Jonah tried to escape to. And then you have Caesarea up here. So let's, let's look and see who went where. All right. Apollos of Acts and 1 Corinthians went and became the bishop of Caesarea. And you had Jason who was received Paul in Acts 17. It was mentioned in Romans 16. Jason, remember they, they attacked his house where they were meeting. So Jason, he becomes the bishop over Tarsus. Um, then Thomas sent Thaddeus to King uh, uh, Bargus in Edessa. And there's a real neat story about Edessa, but I'm not going to be able to get to it right now. I'll tell you later, because we're going to have to have part two of this. Um, and the part two is going to be the plot of the Jesuits. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Uh, Evodius followed by Ignatius. So Evodius went there, then he was killed. He was martyred for his faith. And Ignatius, the apostle John's disciple, took over. Now, this is why I tell you, remember they said they thought that this Syriac Peshetta translation of the Bible, that it was in the hands of John? Yeah, it was. What John handed it to, guess who? Ignatius. And Ignatius took it here so they could evangelize and establish the Christians and churches in this area of Syria. Um, you had Lucius of Acts that's mentioned in the book of Acts. He was actually in Acts 13. He was actually one of the, one of the prophets and teachers at the church of Antioch that laid hands on the apostle Paul and Barnabas and sent them out. He was actually an elder to Paul. And then you have Aristarchus. He was a companion, a companion of the apostle Paul. He's mentioned in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament as well. He went here. Look at all these. Look here down in Damascus. I can't see it, but Ananias. You know who, who was sent there? Ananias that prayed for Paul's vision to come back. It's an, isn't it awesome? God sent him back to Damascus. I love it. He's like, oh, I got to go back to Damascus. Right? Now, you see why we know they took the scriptures to Syria and translated it. There it is. You can see some of their names in this thing. And I, I like this. Now, now, how much time do I have? What time is it? I got 15 minutes? Okay. We get to Byzantium. Somebody say Byzantium. That's just fun to say, isn't it? Now, here's where it gets even more important. So you have, notice, notice where you have the apostles go to like North Italy, to Europe. You had them go to the Middle East, to the Syria area. They were already in Israel. Thomas actually went down into Africa. And you had, actually they say Paul actually went in as far as going into Spain. We have evidence that Paul went all the way to Spain. Um... But what was interesting is, is the, um, when things went east into the Greek world, because remember, the New Testament was written in Greek by the apostles. Everyone spoke Greek. And so you see this disciple here, of the disciples, he, Stachus is one of the 70 that Jesus sent out. He's listed in the list, and he was sent to be the bishop over Byzantium. Well, Byzantium was Constantinople. He was sent there before the fall of Constantinople. Think about that. And that is where they took the scriptures into the Greek. Well, see, guess what? If the scriptures are by the apostles were written in Greek and you take them to the Greek world, guess what you don't need? You don't need a translation. You just have it there. But you know what they did there? In the in there in the, the Greek speaking world or what we call the Byzantine Empire, they constantly copied and made copies of the scriptures for over a thousand years. 
is what they did. It says, according to Hippolytus, disciple of Irenaeus, disciple of Polycarp, disciple of the Apostle John, uh, and that the Apostle Andrew went into this region. So Apostle Andrew went here into this area, right? Um, he went to, to the region of the Thracians and the Scythians to preach the gospel of Jesus. There's no doubt that he took the scriptures. That is the region that became the Byzantine Empire with its capital being Byz Byzantium that became Constantinople. Before Andrew was martyred, he ordained Stachus to be bishop of Byzantium. Stachus was listed by Hippolytus as one of the 70 that Jesus sent out in Luke 10. This gives a direct connection of the Byzantine Greek Christians to the apostles and the 70. So the, that's very important. They are connected to the, to the apostles through Stachus, through Barnabas. And this was all related to us from those people that came down from the apostle John. So here's the Roman Empire. When it fell, of course, it divided in half. It says, after Constantine died, the Roman Empire split east and west. The map shows uh, the extent of the Byzantine Empire from 330 A.D. having been started as a Greek colony a thousand years before Constantinople. Uh, Byzantium was thoroughly Greek. The language of the Byzantine Empire was Koine Greek, the same language in which the New Testament had been written. The Byzantines kept the Koine Greek language in primary use until 1453. Now, what happened in 1453? Anybody know? Why did, why did things suddenly stop in 1453? It's called the Ottoman Empire. The Muslims came, and they overthrew and took over. And they drove the Greek-speaking people, had to run for their lives. Many, many died, but many fled. Guess where they fled with their Greek manuscripts that they had been copying for a thousand years? They fled to Europe. I'm going to show you. What was the Greek church? Europe fell into the dark ages. It says here, they had great libraries. I mean, one library had 120,000 manuscripts in it, books. Um... Bibles were being preserved in these great, they had what they called scriptoriums, where scribes would just, that's all they did all day long. They would just copy the scriptures. And they did this for a thousand years. A thousand years. And, and this is what's important. They were completely the Greek Orthodox or the Eastern Orthodox Church that they became called were completely separate from the Roman Catholic Church. They were actually at odds with them. And they're the ones copying the scriptures in Greek that came from the apostles that was written in Greek. And they maintain that or God used them to preserve the Greek Bible, the Greek New Testament for a thousand years. And then the Ottoman Turks come in, Constantinople falls, people are being slaughtered by Muslims. People flee to Europe around 1453. And what, so hap what started happening right after that in 1453? Right after that into the early 1500s, they started translating the, the, the Bible from Latin into taking the Greek and checking the Latin and doing both. Because they didn't have it. They, they had Jer Jerome's Bible was was dominating at the time. And so all of this stuff went into there's there's the scriptoriums and more about that. Duke University actually had one of their uh, Byzantine manuscripts from like the 10th century and were trying to keep it. And they were ordered to give it back. They're beautiful. They would they did all this by hand. You see that? They would write it and they would do these uh, do that artwork in these bibles. They were beautiful. And this just tells about that 10th century Byzantine manuscript. So I've already shared that with you. So let's, we can scoot ahead here. 
So many of the Greek New Testament manuscripts were deep preserved in Constantinople for centuries, the city known as Byzantium. Before becoming Constantinople, later Istanbul was the significant center for the preservation and copying of these texts. Um, after the fall of Constantinople in 1543, many of these manuscripts were transported to Western Europe. So that's what you had them going there. And guess where they ended up? In that same area and into England, into France. Now here's a guy, George um, Hermonymus, <laughs> these names. Here's what he, he was born before 1435. He died in 1503. He was known as Hermonymus of Sparta. He was a 15th century Greek scribe. So he was one of the guys in Byzantium. In Constantinople, he was one of those guys that would copy the scriptures, and he was a Greek scholar, of course. He knew the Greek language perfectly. When he fled, guess what? He started teaching in a college in France. Guess who was one of his students? A guy named Erasmus of Rotterdam. Now, Erasmus is a very important name. We're not going to be able to finish, but Erasmus... Oh, oh, and I found out, too, that while Hermonymus was a professor in the University of Sorbonne in Paris, that he was doing, making copies of the Bible in Greek, and his student was Erasmus. There's one of his works. Look at that. That's an 11th century, but that's what they look like. Now I'm going to pause, actually I'm just going to pause right here because it's time, i got to stop. Because I knew there would be no way I'd get through this whole thing. But leading up to, and I'll just close it with this, how do I put it? The drama gets more as we get to, uh, to the Jesuit plot. But this was the attitude, look in 1229, 1234, 1408, 1559. These were issued by the Roman Catholic popes at the time. Uh, their, their synods, when they would get together, they forbid the reading or owning of the Vaudois Bible. They didn't want people having the old Latin, the Itala. That was in 1229. They were, 1229, they were brutally killing. I mean, it was massacre upon massacre of these people uh, because they had the Bible and were preaching it. Then you had 1234, the Council of, of Terra uh, Aragona, no Bible permitted. This is what, this is, these are issues, commandments of the Roman Catholic Church to them. No Bible permitted in one's native language. All of them must be burned. 1408, Third Synod of Oxford, heresy to have an unauthorized, preserved English Bible. So if you had a Bible translated, passed down from the Byzantine Empire, from the Greek, the traditional Textus Receptus, if you had a Bible like that, uh, you were in trouble. You were, because back then, if you were charged with heresy by the Roman Catholic Church, you, that was a death sentence. Uh, 1559, the Council of Trent preserved Bibles are on the index of prohibited books. I'm going to show you that all the way into the 20th and 21st century, the attitude of the Roman Catholic Church has never changed concerning the Bible. But they, they came up with a new strategy. They knew they couldn't stop us from having the Bible, so what they did was they buried us in translations. But translations they approved of. And this is what's wild. If you have an NIV, an RSV, an ASV, if you have any of those, they're approved by the Pope. And the Greek text that they changed in the 1800s to make the Bibles, the new Bibles, guess what? That's approved by the Pope too. Now, can I tell you something? If the Popes approve of a Bible, it probably isn't the right one. Amen. And you're going to see, Sal's going to follow me here in a minute. I, I, I got my... Sons in the faith coming up in the Sal and Jordan, because I knew I needed them to help cover this topic. And, and let me tell you, getting them to prepare for this and study for this, they it set them on fire, and God has given them some, 
some revelation and some amazing things. But just know this. We'll, we'll, we'll start from Erasmus tonight. God willing. But just know this. The King James Bible is translated from the correct, preserved Greek text that was handed down from the apostles to their disciples, to their disciples, to their disciples. There are people that have translated that Bible into Latin, into Syrian, into Goth, into all these different languages who paid with their lives so you could have it. And all this other stuff out there, and I'm going to deal with the lies about King James, all of this stuff is to get you away and into a perverted version. And you're going to see, because Sal's going to show you, when you compare the two, when you compare the Bibles that came from the, the Roman Catholic approved Greek text and Vulgate, and when you compare it to the ones that came from to the King James, it has been changed. But folks, I want to tell you right now, my King James Bible is the best translation for the English-speaking people that's ever been done. You're going to see it's been refined seven times, hasn't it, Sal? Amen. All right, let's stand. Take a quick break, 10 minutes, and then Sal's going to start. In fact, his, his title is preserved seven times. You're going to see it. What's that? Purified seven times. I'm sorry. Purified. Refined. So let's pray real quick. Lord, bless Sal. Anoint him. Bless Lord Jordan and all the speakers today. Matt and everybody that's going to speak. Lord, we pray for your anointing. Chad, Lord, everybody that you're going to speak, have speak in this conference. Bless them and anoint them. Lord, let this teaching, this instruction, this history lesson sink down in our hearts. We need to know where we come from. And I pray that you make this real in every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, 10 minutes.